Fun fact, we are now two and a half years into the Matt Canada era in Pittsburgh, and they still have not had a single game of 400 plus yards of offense. Trust me, I did not believe it when I first heard it either, but that is a very real stat and also a very depressing stat. And I don't necessarily believe that this is all Kenny Pickett's fault either, because uh, honestly, no matter who you throw into this offense, they're probably not gonna perform that well because the entire structure of this system is horrifyingly ancient. This team relies on dated philosophies, hyper-conservative concepts, and a startling lack of awareness of how modern offenses actually move the ball. So if you are a Steelers fan and you're watching this and you had a uh, unfortunately misplaced hope that this episode was gonna give you any sort of warm fuzzies or optimism at all, or that it was gonna make you feel like everything's fixable, sorry, it's not. Uh, this one's gonna hurt. It's gonna hurt real bad. But if you just stick with me to the end, I promise we will get through this together. There are many, many problems with how this Steelers offense is structured, but I'm just going to focus on the three main issues that I believe this team has. Number one is Matt Canada's early down play selection, and in particular, his early down passing play selection that seems to do everything possible to avoid explosive play opportunities. Number two is the maddening predictability of the Steelers offense on second downs, which ends up making their third downs even harder. And number three is their refusal to use modern passing philosophies like utilizing motion at the snap to manufacture space, like a lot of the NFL's top offense do, which essentially forces Kenny Pickett and his receivers to just go win on pure talent alone. Let's start with the first point on that list, which is early down play selection, because when it comes to the Steelers' run-pass ratio on first down, they're dead average in the NFL at 47.8% run calls to pass calls, which in itself is not a bad thing. And believe it or not, the Steelers actually have the sixth highest explosive run rate in the league on first down. But the bad part is that when they do call a first down passing play, generally speaking, they just treat it as a run play with extra steps, and they don't make that big of an effort to try to generate explosive passes on first down. They have the third shortest average depth of target on first down at only 7.1 yards, which is really shallow relative to the rest of the league. And schematically speaking, Pickett is often throwing these easy, quick hitting concepts on first down like Dragon, Lion, Hank, and Mesh, as well as an endless supply of sprint outs with just that one isolated curl, comeback, or out route for Kenny to throw. And of course, the customary swing screens and bubble screens. In my opinion, the Steelers are using this philosophy on first down with their passing game to essentially mimic the effect of a strong first down run game to get consistent five and six yard gains, which they hope will set up a lot of second and medium opportunities, which ideally will then set up a lot of third and short opportunities. And all of that is well and good. But here's the problem. Many of the best offenses in the NFL are the offenses that skip second and third down entirely and who try to create explosive passes on first down when they do throw the ball in that situation. If you look at this scatter plot of all offenses on first down specifically, the x-axis is the percentage of first downs that are designed runs, while the y-axis is the percentage of called passes that are explosive, meaning they gain 15 or more yards. A lot of the offenses that are up in the top right quadrant are some of the highest scoring teams in the league. As of me recording this, the Dolphins are first in points per game, the Niners are second, the Lions are eighth, Baltimore is 10th, Seattle is 11th, and Houston is 14th. All of those offenses are very run heavy on first down, percentage wise, but they're also extremely explosive on first down when throwing the ball. So even if some of them don't throw it that much compared to other teams, whenever they do throw it, they make it count. Also, just in case you didn't notice, the Steelers are all the way at the bottom of this scatter plot with the absolute lowest explosive pass percentage on first down at a paltry 7.1%. Now, for the actual good offenses in the NFL, one of the ways that they generate explosive passes on first down so that they don't have to worry about trying to get chunks on second and third down is by using play action. If we look at a second scatter plot now, where the y-axis is still first down explosive pass percentage, while the x-axis is now play action pass percentage, you can see a mostly similar group of teams up in the top right quadrant. The Dolphins, Lions, Seahawks, Bills, and Ravens are five of the top 10 scoring teams, while the Jags and Cowboys are two other top scoring teams that are basically right there as well. 
So again, there is a clear pattern here. Great offenses get explosive plays on early downs so that they can try to avoid third downs entirely, and great offenses generate those explosives through play action. The Steelers, again, are at the very bottom of the pile in early down explosive passes, and that is partly because they have the fourth lowest rate of their passes being play action at just 26.5%. Now, when it comes to how play action actually generates these explosive gains, some of you may have visions in your head of these super long developing dropbacks with hard run fakes and like a corner post route that's getting thrown 50 yards down the field. And yes, those do happen from time to time, but not very often. Truth be told, most explosive play action passes are actually thrown to the intermediate area of the field right behind the linebackers. The play action fakes themselves are basically just a mechanism to create that space to hit slants, dig routes, over routes, or crossing routes in an effort to get easy first downs, as well as to create big run after the catch opportunities. The fact that the Steelers do not attack that area of the field and that they don't use those types of concepts on first down is a big reason why they're basically the opposite of an explosive passing game. If you look at Kenny Pickett's passing chart for first down, which tracks the target location for every single pass Pickett has thrown on that down in particular, he's attacked in between the numbers inside of 20 yards only 17 times all season so far. The concentration of most of his completions is clearly either at the numbers or outside of the numbers towards the sidelines, while the middle of the field is largely avoided. Contrast that image with the first down passing chart for the Dolphins now, who are the most explosive passing attack on first down, or really any down and distance if we're being honest, they relentlessly attack the short and intermediate middle of the field with most of those throws being on play action. It's the same story for the second most explosive passing game as well, the 49ers. They also focus on attacking the middle area of the field on first down and manipulating linebackers with motion and misdirection. And yet again, for the third most explosive first down passing game, Detroit, they do it too. They also work the middle of the field most of the time, especially inside of 10 yards, and they create yards after catch opportunities to get big chunk plays. Even Kansas City, with all of their problems at receiver, they too work the middle of the field to get explosive passes. Or how about even Buffalo? I mean, the Bills for a long time, they've been the definition of a team that overly relies on throws outside the numbers, and even they work the middle of the field at a higher rate on first down than Pittsburgh does. It's like the Steelers go out of their way to only throw concepts where their receivers have a long way to go just to move the sticks, because God forbid they throw more than 10 yards down the field. And once their receivers do get the ball, they have to try to find a way of generating an explosive play while also being walled off on one side by the boundary, because that's the primary area where Matt Canada is willing to give them touches. Football is a game of space when it comes down to it. And if you, as an offensive coordinator, are purposefully limiting the space that your players have to operate in because of the types of concepts that you're calling, then yeah, of course the offense is going to be bad. Of course the team is going to barely get any big gains on first down. And of course they're going to constantly end up in second and seven situations, which then turn into third and nines when Najee Harris has to run directly into a brick wall. The failure of this passing game as it is structured right now is inevitable. And that's because the Steelers have basically designed their offense to always go through the path of most resistance. That constant willful struggle is exactly why this team is flat out exhausting to watch. And ultimately that's on the coaching staff more than anybody else. Now, one of the only fun parts of watching the Steelers offense this year has been seeing George Pickens grow. I think he's one of the best young X receivers in the NFL and somebody who could develop into a truly dominant force if he ever played in an offense that actually featured his skill set. You could argue that one of the only consistent pass plays that this offense has had all year is when a very clearly frustrated and annoyed Kenny Pickett will get to the fourth quarter and nothing's been working all day. And so he'll just say, fuck it, George is down there somewhere and just starts lobbing fades to him down the boundary. Most of the time it works and it's awesome. I'm hoping to see a few more of those this Thursday night. And of course, I will be live streaming during the game and giving more live thoughts and analysis on it over on the Bootleg Football Podcast channel. 
That is my second channel where, of course, my podcast lives. We do live streams for every single TNF game. So if you're interested in stopping by and saying hello, of course, that channel is linked down in the description below. We also fill out pick entries on Underdog for every single TNF game. So if you're planning to play along with us for that as well, all new and existing players on Underdog who use our link in the description or promo code bootleg on deposit will get access to a free special for the game, which is George Pickens at higher than half a yard. So he literally just needs a single receiving yard for that space on your entry to hit. And of course, everybody who uses our link also gets a deposit match up to $500. So again, hit that link in the description below, or if you're watching on TV or on computer, there's a QR code on screen right now that'll take you right to it. If you plan on watching the game with us tomorrow night, believe me, having an underdog entry going at the same time is one of the most reliable ways to make the game watchable and remotely entertaining. I speak from experience. There's been a lot of bad TNF games. Uh, and one that I only half remember because the Bears decided to score 40 points the one time I said I would take a shot at Malort every time they scored. I still haven't forgiven them for that. But anyway, uh, thank you to Underdog for partnering with us and helping to make this episode possible. Again, hope to see you guys on the bootleg football stream tomorrow night. And with that, let's get to my second major issue that I have with this Steelers offense from a schematic perspective. Their nauseating predictability on second down. When the Steelers are in second and long in particular, meaning second and seven plus yards to go, they are maddeningly run heavy. It's one thing to run a lot on second and short to try to move the chains, which a lot of teams do for efficiency's sake, but running on second and long is an extremely low efficiency play from an analytics perspective. Pittsburgh had the second highest rushing rate in the league on second and long situations going into week eight, so teams knew it was coming. And as a result, defenses just played downhill and flew into the backfield in those situations, which resulted in the average yards before contact for Steelers running backs being negative 0.2 yards, as in the average first contact for Najee Harris and Jalen Warren was behind the line of scrimmage. In second and long situations, the Steelers face cover three about 38% of the time, which is a 10% increase compared to the average amount of cover three they face across all downs and distances, which is only about 28%. And if we also include cover one and just expand it to say all middle field closed structures that have a safety down in the box, their overall number goes up to 50%. So the Steelers face pack boxes on literally half of their second and long situations. Defenses know that Pittsburgh is probably gonna run the ball. And so they get a ton of these tackles for loss or tackles for no gain that make third downs even harder than they already are for the Steelers. And of course, they're also horrifically bad in third and long too, maybe even worse than they are in second and long. And that right there is a good jumping off point for my final and maybe most crucial observation today. Everything is so much harder than it needs to be from a schematic perspective. Matt Canada's route concepts aren't unique. Like every other team calls the exact same stuff that Canada calls himself. It's just that the way he gets into these concepts is not built to help his players win their matchups. He does not do a good job of manufacturing space through motion or through formation. He doesn't help his receivers with stacks and bunches to get free access on their releases. He's over-reliant on hitches, curls, comebacks, or basically any other route that just involves stopping and turning around and presenting your numbers to the quarterback. Everything is static. Nothing is designed to stress either man coverage or match zone coverage, which is basically just man coverage, but with zone coverage principles. It's almost as if Canada is calling the game like defenses still play spot drop zone, like it's the 90s or something, and that receivers can just settle in between zones to get free catches like in Madden. That's not how defense works in the pros in 2023. I mean, hell, it's not even how defense works in college in 2023. DBs stick to receivers, even in zone. They play them really tight to try to force tough throws. So you as a play designer and play caller have to force defenses to give you space so that your receivers can do their jobs. How the very best play callers in the NFL these days force defenses to give that space is through motion. And in particular, motion at the snap. Again, using the Dolphins as an example, they're almost inarguably the best offense in the league this year, and they also happen to lead the league in motion at the snap. They've used it 188 times. Meanwhile, the Steelers are 31st in motion at the snap, and they've only used it 29 times for an average of just four plays a game. 
The Dolphins manufacture space basically at will by using motion at the snap to make DBs back off because they have to sort out all of their coverage responsibilities on the fly as the ball is snapped. That's just kind of how zone coverages work. And they can't do that if Tyreek Hill is going from being the number three to the number two to the number one in an instant as the ball is snapped. They all have different responsibilities where they have to count from the outside in who's the number one, who's the number two, who's the number three. And if that number is going to change that quickly, the secondary has to back up and give space so that they can read it out and play their assignments without screwing up. It's basically a cheat code for Miami because you're forcing them to back up. And when you have a guy like Tyreek Hill, who's pretty much automatically going to be open when you give him that space, I mean, yeah, it now makes a whole lot of sense why Miami's been so good this year. But it's not even just the Dolphins. I mean, Houston does the same thing because they don't have Tyreek Hill. And so they're going out of their way to make CJ Stroud's job as easy as possible by using motion at the snap with Nico Collins and Tank Dell as his main one-two punch. The Texans have used this kind of motion at the fifth highest rate in the league because offensive coordinator Bobby Slowick understands the value of using it to help his receivers get easier releases which then translates to being more open against man coverage, which then translates to easier throws for his young quarterback. I truly do not understand why Matt Canada refuses to lean into this trend because every great modern offense is doing it and it works for all of them. And you know what? At the end of the day, I think that stubbornness to change is the biggest sin out of everything we've covered. This Steelers offense is almost deliberately ancient in its approach. And at this point, Canada is purposefully putting all of the burden on Kenny Pickett and his receivers to just go out there and win games by themselves. Truth be told, after studying this offense in depth, I don't even think it's fair to judge Kenny Pickett's future as an NFL quarterback as long as he is playing in this offense. The evaluation cannot possibly be completed under these circumstances, just like the evaluation of Tua could not really be a fair one until Mike McDaniel arrived in Miami. For all we know, Pickett could be the next Jared Goff, and I don't mean that in a bad way at all because I think Goff is really, really good, but we're never going to know the answer as long as this is the system that he's playing in. It's just impossible. The only thing that I know I can say for sure about the Steelers right now is that we are all wasting our time waiting for this to get better. It's not going to get better. And the sooner that the Steelers top brass accepts that truth, the sooner they can move on and find a solution. All right. Uh, I know this episode was a long one, and I do thank you for being here for the entirety of it. But I did forget one thing. As you know, I always have a drink uh, either on screen or off to the side while I'm recording because it helps me uh, get through it. And I forgot to shout out who I'm drinking this week. And you know what? I figured I talked so much shit on Pittsburgh for the last hour and a half, two hours that I should highlight something awesome about Pittsburgh, and that is uh, Wiggle. They are a distillery in Pittsburgh. I visited them the last time I was in Western PA over the summer. They got a, a location right on the strip and they do phenomenal work. This is their Madeira cask finish. I cannot recommend it enough. So if you live in Western PA and you're looking for something to help you get through watching the Steelers every single Sunday, again, I cannot possibly emphasize enough uh, how much I recommend Wiggle. They're great. So anyway, that'll do it for me today. I'll see you guys back here uh, very soon for something entirely different, which is my way of saying that I haven't decided on my next topic. So if you guys have any suggestions, feel free to leave them down below. And um, yeah, with that, cheers. <laughs>